Zack Fair was born in the town of Gungagat and had the childhood dream of joining Shinra's soldier ranks to become a first class soldier. At the age of 13, Zack left Gungagat without telling his parents and joined the Shinra military forces. After many years with Shinra, Zack had reached soldier second class under the tutorage of soldier first class Angio Hewley. Angio's words of wisdom and strong sense of honor had a profound effect on Zack, who wanted to emulate his mentor. During his time as a member of Soldier, Zack would make many friends which included the legendary soldier Sephiroth, and after a successful mission in the city of Wutai, Zack was informed that by Sephiroth that his mentor Angio had abandoned Shinra and joined the forces of a rogue soldier agent named Genesis. However, Zack refused to believe his mentor would desert Shinra, and after some time Zack would finally be promoted to the status of Soldier First Class. However, Zack seemed very unsatisfied despite the fact that he had achieved his childhood dream, and soon after the city of Midgar was attacked by Genesis' forces, Zack would confront his old mentor. Refusing to fight him, Angio would knock Zack off the platform, causing him to fall into the Sons of Midgard. And it was at this time that Zack would crash through the roof of the Sector 5 church, meeting the young flower girl, Aerith. The two form a very strong friendship and over the next two years would stay in contact over cell phone conversations while on missions for Shinra. On a mission to the mountain of Modihem, Zack would meet and befriend the young infantryman Cloud Strife, and over time the two would become best friends. However, while on the same mission, Zack would be forced to face his mentor Angel in battle, and after a long hard fought battle, Zack emerged victorious, with his final words Angel passing on his buster sword to Zack. While on a mission to the mountain city of Nimblehim, he would witness his fellow soldier agent Sephiroth suffer a psychotic breakdown after discovering the truth of his origins. Zack was forced to battle Sephiroth, however, after a short battle, Zack was defeated, and it was at this time that his best friend Cloud Strife would pick up Zack's busted sword and would attempt to engage Sephiroth, but would be impaled by Sephiroth's Masamune twice, but somehow was able to overpower Sephiroth, forcing him to jump deep into the Mako's reactor. Both Zack and Cloud would be retrieved by Dr. Hojo and used for four years as experiments, and after escaping Dr. Hojo's lab, Zack and Cloud made their way to the outskirts of Midgard, where they were intercepted by a large Shinra army force. Zack decided to hide Cloud's body out of sight and left to engage the army. Although he fought bravely, Zack was overwhelmed by Shinra's forces and gunned down. In his last moments, Zack passed on his bus sword to Cloud and told him that he was his living legacy. After Zack's death, Cloud would go through a dramatic transformation. Due to the combination of the trauma caused by the Nimbalim incident, the Mako poisoning, and witnessing Zack's death, Cloud would impress Zack's own memories and fighting abilities onto his own alongside Tifa's memories of creating a reality in his mind that he himself had joined Soldier and that Zack had never existed claiming that he himself was a former first class soldier. Shortly after this event, Cloud would run into Tifa at the Sector 7 slums train station, and after being nursed back to health, Tifa asked Cloud to join the anti Shinra terrorist group Avalanche. Cloud agreed, and after joining forces with the fellow Avalanche member Barrett Wallace, would successfully destroy the Mako Sector's one Mako reactor. After taking part in a second mission to destroy another Mako reactor, Cloud would be separated from his allies and would fall into the Sector 5's church slums. And it was at this time that Cloud would meet for the second time the young flower girl Aerith, and would agree to be her bodyguard. After Cloud reunited with his friends, Shinra dropped the Sector 7 plate, crushing the Sector 7 slums in the process, kidnapping Aerith. Cloud would lead an attack on the Shinra headquarters, and after successfully rescuing Aerith and defeating the new president of Shinra, Rufus, would escape Midgard, but not before discovering that the legendary soldier Sephiroth had somehow returned. As Cloud and his friends would travel all around the world, they would find themselves traveling to the Temple of the Ancients, and using Aerith's inner power, she was able to discover what the reincarnated Sephiroth was planning to do and how to stop him. Choosing to go off on her own, Aerith traveled to the Forgotten Capital and began praying for the Holy, the ultimate white magic to defend against a meteor that Sephiroth was planning to use to destroy the world. Cloud arrived just in time to see Aerith finish praying, but was forced to watch as Aerith was stabbed in the back by Sephiroth, killing her. Cloud carried her body to the pool of water in the center of the Forgotten Capital and laid her body to rest beneath the water. After recovering from a second dose of Mako poisoning, Cloud and his allies would pursue Sephiroth into the depths of the planet with the aid of Aerith's spirit with not only defeating Sephiroth but saving the world from an oncoming meteor. Two
Before his fall from grace, Sephiroth was the most revered and successful warrior of the Shinra Electric Power Company's soldier program. A great warrior idolized by the public and infantryman alike for his strength and discipline in combat, Sephiroth's many successes on the field of battle during the conflict surrounding the Shinra Electric Power Company's bid for global domination led to his status as a celebrity war hero and the poster boy for the Shinra military and soldier program. During a standard mission to the mountain town of Nibelheim's Mega Reactor, Sephiroth would discover the truth behind his creation, and after coming to believe that he was the only remaining survivor of the ancients, Sephiroth rebelled against the Shinra Electric Power Company and enacted a worldwide vendetta against the corruption of mankind. His ultimate goal was to take control of the life stream and with its power become a godlike being. After discovering the remains of his genetic mother Genova inside a mega reactor, it was here that Sephiroth would face the newly promoted first class soldier Zack Fair. However, after a quick engagement, Sephiroth would defeat Zack, knocking him out and would return to stand in the presence of his genetic mother. While looking on, Sephiroth would be stabbed in the back by the infantryman Cloud Strife, mortally wounding him. Sephiroth began to regain his footing and after decapitating his genetic mother's head, began to make his way out of the center core of the Mega Reactor, where Cloud and the injured Zack Fair would be waiting for him. Cloud picked up Zack's buster sword once again and would attempt to re-engage Sephiroth, but Sephiroth would easily deflect the young Cloud strike and would impale him on his blade. However, not only did this young infantryman not die, but he somehow managed to build up the strength to lift up Sephiroth and would toss him over the edge into the depths of the Mako Reactor, supposedly killing Sephiroth. After being labeled as dead for five years, Sephiroth would make his return in an attempt to call the Great Meteor to destroy the world. However, after Cloud Strife and his allies discovered Sephiroth's plan, he would track the young flower girl Aerith down, who happened to be a descendant of the ancients to the forgotten capital, and as she began praying for the holy, Sephiroth would emerge and would stab Aerith in the back, killing her. As the giant meteor was nearing the planet, Sephiroth would travel into the depths of the planet, but Cloud and his allies would follow and engage him for a final attempt to save the world. And after a long, hard-fought battle, Sephiroth would be defeated with Cloud Strife delivering the final killing blow, sending Sephiroth's spirit into the life stream, where it could do no more harm. Well, what's up again there guys, Brian here at 3 Hit Hitter present what could end up being my very last Final Fantasy vs. series matchup. And in the hopes of possibly increasing the demand and viewership of the series, I decided to bring together the three most popular characters that I have ever used during my entire vs. series run through of four years, as this will be my first and possibly last two-on-one engagement, as the best friends Zack and Cloud will take on the most powerful member of the Shinra Soldier project. Project, as well as the greatest swordsman in the history of Final Fantasy, Sephiroth. Now before I begin, I would just like to clarify a few things. For starters, I will be using Zack as he was after defeating Genesis, but before he was gunned down by Shinra. For Cloud, I will be using him as he was immediately after defeating Sephiroth at the end of Final Fantasy VII. And for Sephiroth, I will be using him strictly in his base form at the height of his power in Final Fantasy VII, which means no Black Materia, no Sephiroth Safer, and for God's sake, no Supernova. I want to make that very, 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 very clear. No Supernova. In terms of sources, I will be focusing on the depiction of these three characters as they are presented in the games Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core, as well as some, but not all, elements of their combative capabilities depicted in the Dissidia games. And when it comes to films, I will be focusing on how they are presented in the animated films Last Order and some elements from Advent Children. On an analytical level, since Zack and Cloud are more or less similar in nearly every possible department, when it comes to analyzing both of them, I'll be judging them as a pair and not as individuals. Also, to save time when it came to scripting and editing this extensive breakdown of my very first two-on-one matchup, I will be reusing some clips that I used during my Sephiroth vs. Virgil matchup because information-wise regarding him, not really much has changed, if anything, since that video was made. So if you notice a slight change in voice quality, that's why. So with that out of the way, let us begin as I will start by comparing these three physically. Thank you. 
Right before his death at the hands of Shinra, Zack was a 23 year old human male standing either 6 foot 1 or 6 foot 3 depending on which source you're looking at, and by the end of Final Fantasy 7, Cloud was a 21 year old human male standing 5 foot 7 or 5 foot 8 again depending on which source you're looking at. Both Zack and Cloud were injected with Genova cells, which were DNA samples from an extraterrestrial creature named Genova, who is mistakenly believed to be an ancient. During Shinra's experiments with these Genova cells, scientists took multiple samples that were genetically manipulated to create various different types of Genova cells, which were injected into human DNA, which resulted in mostly similar but different classes of super soldiers. While Zack was injected with a slightly inferior sample of Genova cells when he first entered the rank of Soldier 3rd Class, Cloud was injected with a pure sample of the Genova cells, which just so happened to be the exact same samples that were created to use Sephiroth. With these enhancements, both Zack and Cloud were granted superhuman levels of strength, speed, reflexes, stamina, and durability. Both have shown to be able to jump great distances with little to no effort, but due to the fact that Cloud was not granted nearly as much proper training or even gained as much combat experience as Zack did, there is no question that Zack exceeded Cloud in every physical department, even adding an exceptional level of flexibility and being far more acrobatic than Cloud was shown to be able to do, as he was able to perform dodges and flips by numerous Shinra soldiers that were firing at him from multiple directions. However, this does not mean that Cloud was very lacking in the physical performance era. It should be noted that due to the fact that Cloud was injected with a pure and superior form of Genova cells, it, it may have allowed Cloud's body to develop much faster than Zack. Zack spent years building up his physical body through regular workout sessions, training simulations, and on-the-field combat missions, while Cloud was able to achieve a rather high level of physical performance in as little as 43 days. So the fact that Cloud was able to do so much, even with the help of his allies, making up for what he lacked physically, in such a short time, this should give Cloud a lot of combative credit in my eyes. During the time of Final Fantasy VII, Sephiroth would have been approximately 27 years old and could be classified as a human hybrid standing 6 foot 1 of a solid muscular build. While still in the womb of his mother, Sephiroth was injected with Genova cells, and once he was born, though he did not gain the power to speak to the planet like the ancients could, it was decided that he would develop into becoming the first in a new class of super soldier. Thanks to the Genova cells in his body, he gained superhuman levels of strength, speed, stamina, reflexes, and endurance. His strength was sufficient enough to cut through entire sections of buildings with very little effort. He has shown to be able to jump great distances and heights with little effort. His speed and reflexes were high enough to allow him to not only engage and defeat entire armies of enemies, but allowed him to fight off multiple opponents at once who shared his own superhuman combative properties. And his speed, if he focused enough, could actually be enhanced to a level that he could actually move faster than the average human eye could see. His stamina levels were enhanced to the point that Sephiroth never appeared to show any signs of combative performance weakness at any point during any fight, and he could easily carry on for days, possibly weeks at a time with no sleep needed. And though his level of endurance over the course of Final Fantasy VII has been somewhat inconsistent, there is however one serious physical weakness that Sephiroth has shown, and that is that he has a surprisingly low quality of durability. In almost every single official canon appearance of Sephiroth that has ever been presented to date, he has either been mortally wounded by a single attack or brought down by a single special attack, and when one realizes that there are numerous enemies of lesser quality throughout the Final Fantasy VII series that have been able to easily survive attacks that have managed to bring Sephiroth down, to his core as a combatant, Sephiroth is the definition of a glass cannon. He is physically built to perform combatively at a high level and deal a lot of damage, but he cannot take the punishment to back it up, which is a weakness that his Kingdom Hearts version has never suffered from, which is why to me, I have always viewed that version to be vastly superior to the canon version. Okay, this department is easy to call. There is absolutely no question that on a purely physical level, Sephiroth outclasses both Zack and Cloud in every single department but durability. On an individual level, should one take on Sephiroth, 
they would just barely have enough to keep up with him. But perhaps if these two work together properly, then they may improve their odds, but not nearly enough to place or grant them any sort of advantage in this department. So for these reasons, Sephiroth gets the unquestionable edge in physical capabilities. Now, thanks to Zack's training and combat experience while he was a member of Soldier, and because Cloud for a majority of his time throughout Final Fantasy VII the game was pretty much spent at mimicking Zack's approach to magical uses and allowed his allies to be more reliant on the use of magic, it's fair to say that in terms of their magical approaches and uses that they are probably almost identical. So they would use all the same spells that are pretty common to members of Soldier to use, and that in Zack's case, he would only use them if he absolutely needed to. And when it comes to their use of enhanced physical attacks, this too would be somewhat identical, but there are a few differences. Where these two diverse is, however, in their limit break attacks. Now between these two, Cloud and Zack will have access to as many as 15 different Limit Breaker attacks, with all of seven of Cloud's being strictly offensive with attacks like Braver, Cross Slash, and Omni Slash, and Zack having a collection of both offensive and supported Limit Break attacks in the form of Octa Slash, which he learned from several of himself for offense, Lucky Stars, which can instantly make all of Zack's sword attacks critical hits, and Healing Wave, which he learned from Aerith. However, there is one attack in particular that he somehow learned from his interactions with Genesis in the form of the Apocalypse attack, which was capable of dishing out an extremely high velocity of magical damage. But like always, all of these limit break attacks require time for each combatant to build up their combative gauge and can only be used once at a time. Though Sephiroth was considered by most to have been the greatest member of Soldier who ever lived, he himself did not spend a great deal of time developing his skills with the use of magic, but instead chose to focus on being a dedicated swordsman. However, despite his personal choice of combat, he was no less dangerous with his flexible use of magical abilities. After his immersion into the livestream, he was granted a series of abilities that only amplified his previous magical abilities. He was granted the ability to cast multiple forms of elemental magic spells without the use of materia, however, the spells he could use were somewhat common. He could fly and levitate himself, project illusions into the minds of other beings, and could manifest his Masamun sword at will. Sephiroth also had a very limited control over the physical manifestation of Genova, allowing him to shapeshift her cells into other forms and act through them as if it was his own original body, which allowed Sephiroth to remain alive even should he be killed. He could also mentally manipulate those who had Genova cells within their body, and if their mind was weak enough, could even take control of their bodies, shown as he almost made Cloud Strife strike down Aerith while they were both at the Forgotten Capital. Like many other members in Final Fantasy VII, Sephiroth did have access to two Limit Breakers of his own. The first one was dubbed Octa Slash, which was a sequence of eight sword attacks, while his second Limit Breaker was dubbed Shadow Flare, which allowed Sephiroth to barrage an enemy with dark energy orbs. In the end, though Sephiroth was clearly not the most powerful user of magic within the franchise, it would be a big mistake for anyone regardless of their own strength of magic to underestimate him. The advantage for this department should be obvious, but in a surprise twist it may not go to who you think and there is a reason. Right from the get go, Sephiroth should unquestionably be given the edge for this category. He clearly outclasses both Zack and Cloud in every possible way, and his connection to the magical force that flows through the planet itself, which is the main source and means for how materia is used and created in Final Fantasy VII lore, is far greater than theirs and the fact that he doesn't need to infuse samples of it into his body grants him a level of control and magnitude that Zack and Cloud could only dream of pulling off. Together as a team, they are bringing nothing in their arsenal of magical spells that Sephiroth cannot A. Simply deflect B. Evade it C. Tank the hit or D. Simply override it with his natural greater control of magic. Even Zack and Cloud's collection of enhanced special attacks and limit break attacks will be of little use if they are unable to hit him, 
even a majority of their limit break attacks, some that Sephiroth can even deflect should he choose to not evade him, and in Cloud's case, the only reason that the Omi Slash ever worked at all against him was that the first time he used it on Sephiroth, he was already battered and beating and near the end about to die, so he was in no condition to defend against it. And the last time Cloud used it, he used a new variation of the attack that Sephiroth was not expecting and was caught off guard. But he had proven that he had already successfully defended against an earlier version of the Omi Slash attack in that fight. The only limit break attack between these two that I could see being of any use is the Apocalypse attack. Even that attack is not guaranteed to cause any great amount of damage to Sephiroth despite his lacking durability. But in an overwhelming twist, the advantage for this department will still go to Zack and Cloud. Not because they earned it, but because Sephiroth would be willing to refuse any of his magical offensive spells because he simply doesn't need it. He would be giving himself a handicap which would not affect the outcome of this battle in one bit. Because magically, these two, even together or on their own, could not possibly threaten him in any way. And in order to find a combatant who either seriously threatens Sephiroth or even completely dominates him when it comes to magical capabilities, you have to seriously venture outside of Final Fantasy VII. So with that said, Zack and Cloud will get the pitiful edge in magical and special abilities. Zack and Cloud both wield the Buster Sword, and it has been classified as an enormous broadsword. From the tip of the blade to the butt of the handle, it is approximately 5 to 6 feet long, with a single edge large blade approximately 1 foot wide. There are two holes near the handguard which have been theorized to either be material slots that can be used, or they are simply the clips that Zack and Cloud can use to place the sword on their back. Due to this sword's overall design, this weapon could be quite heavy and it was designed for power strikes. However, a user of this weapon could also use this Buster Sword as a speed weapon if they could enhance their own physical performance high enough. The sword itself also contained a unique ability to fire off an energy wave at an opponent, however these waves could be blocked by well-timed deflection. Sephiroth will be bringing only one weapon at his disposal, and it is his signature iconic long-spanning sword named the Masamun. The Masamun sword measured at about 7 feet long from the butt of the handle to the tip of the blade, and it was a truly unique weapon that was extremely dangerous to fight against in the hands of Sephiroth. With his years of practice with this weapon, Sephiroth was capable of delivering strength, speed, and precision strikes at a multitude of ranges. The weapon also appeared to have the ability to fire off concentrated energy attacks that gave the weapon a sort of projectile slash allowing the weapon to attack opponents that were at a distance. But this ability could be easily defended against with well placed block. The Masamun seemed to also have a unique dark ability that could allow Sephiroth to channel his own dark power into the blade itself allowing it to instantly kill any normal human who was impaled by this weapon. Though, several characters have survived being struck by this weapon, including Tifa when she was a 16 year old teenager, Zack Fair, and a much younger Cloud Strife who survived even being impaled by this weapon easily. However, from my opinion, the Masamun's greatest strength was also its greatest weakness, that being the sword's actual length. It is my belief that due to the length compared to Sephiroth's actual height of 6'1", this weapon was not best used at close ranges. But it has been shown that with practice, Sephiroth was able to use the Masamun at such ranges with some but little difficulty, and has been shown that he could apply a slow defense against multiple strikes at once for a short period of time, but had to immediately jump back in order to increase the distance between himself and his opponents. The practical use of a long weapon is to keep your opponents as far away from you as possible, and because of this, Sephiroth had to switch between two combative modes while wielding the weapon. At a distance, he would apply a one-handed grip to apply quick speed slashes, but once the opponent closed the distance, he would be forced to grip the weapon with both hands to apply blocks and immediate power counterattacks. It seems that the best use of the Masamun sword was to strike out against multiple opponents at once in wide areas, as most engagements that members of Soldier were trained to deal with were against groups of opponents, and one-on-one -on -one engagements were not quite as common. 
To be honest, I don't really see much of an edge for either weapon. All three combatants are very familiar with each other's weapons, and even with my personal gripe with the length of Sephiroth's weapon in a practical sense, that issue has never played a factor in any of Sephiroth's engagements. So for those reasons, no edge will be given for weapons. As mentioned before in this matchup, Cloud spent a majority of his time copying Zack's fighting style and tactical approaches, and by the end, I believe that Cloud was well on his way to working himself up to Zack's combative performance levels, due to the fact that the Genova cells within his body allowed him to develop much faster than the Genova cells that were in Zack's body. So combatively, with both Zack and Cloud being mainly dedicated power duelists, they would use all of their combative skills in a mainly offensive manner and attempt to throw off and overwhelm their opponents, whether it was using their swords or their magical abilities, however limited their use of magic was. Both Zack and Cloud would have been committed users of Forms 1 Cho and Form 5 Xi'an slash Jim So. Shicho was the tutorial fighting form to allow users to better tone themselves on how to properly manipulate the movement of their weapon, and its moveset was comprised of wide sweeping strikes to lash out at multiple opponents. However, the focus on wide sweeping maneuvers and techniques left it with no precision, making the form terrible against a single well trained opponent. Form 5 had two variations in Cien and Gemso. The Xi'an variation was adapted from the Form 3 Cerisus mentality of relying on a focused defense against projectiles, but instead of deflecting them harmlessly away, Xi'an's approach was to deflect the projectiles back at the shooter. Jem So's variation was adapted from the Form 2 Makashi's mentality of being designed for blade to blade combat and relied on performing defensive maneuvers then immediately countering for powerful offensive strike. Forms 5's only real weakness is that because it was so strength focused, it lacked mobility, which could make a user vulnerable to more speed based offenses. But while I believe that Zack's training would have developed his skills to such a degree that he could somewhat cover up for this weakness, this is something Cloud certainly could not, and this is where the differences between Zack and Cloud begin to appear. Zack spent years developing his skill set in combative approaches, and because of this, he had an intimate understanding on exactly what was the best way to perform his maneuvers. Cloud unfortunately did not have this opportunity, so all he could do was mimic from his memories of seeing Zack fight, but because he did not have the tactical knowledge of how to best use, nor was ever placed in a position to have the same kind of combative situations that Zack had to deal with, in the form of Zack always having to fight alone, while Cloud always had allies to fight by his side, Cloud adapted Zack's fighting methods to work within the confounds of the group, and because of this, despite being the most straightforward offensive combatant in his party, practically being the spear tip of their offense, this made Cloud significantly less effective when forced to fight on his own. However, this should not be thought of as a negative grip against Cloud, because even though his variation of Zack's fighting approach was not nearly as toned as Zack's was, he should still be given a lot of credit for being as effective as he was when he fought, and he certainly has a far more efficient mind when it comes to battle tactics and when it comes to making combative improvements on the battlefield, shown as Cloud in only the span of two years was able to elevate and improve Zack's fighting approach, and he also incorporated techniques from Sephiroth which helped Cloud in creating his own unique fighting style, which was far ahead of Zack, making Advent Children Cloud, in my opinion, the second best skilled swordsman in all of Final Fantasy, only behind Sephiroth himself. In the world of Final Fantasy VII, Sephiroth was easily declared as the greatest member of soldier who had ever lived, despite the number of official members of such a group being very small. Sephiroth spent his entire combative career developing and becoming one of the greatest users of the blade within the entire Final Fantasy franchise. His entire approach to combat was based on using his Masumun sword at extremely high speeds in order to dispense large groups of enemies quickly or to completely overwhelm a single opponent with such a high concentrated fury offense that their defense would be completely destroyed. 
However, Sephiroth was not some rage-filled berserker who could only operate using a fury barrage of attacks, but he was easily capable of applying a well-maintained defense along with applying persistent slashes and piercing attacks to take advantage of any openings an opponent could leave open. Based on these traits, Sephiroth would have been a master practitioner in Forms 1 Seicho, Forms 2 Makashi, and Form 4 Ataru. Seicho with its wide sweeping strikes made it perfect to deal with multiple opponents at once, either in a controlled area or out on the battlefield. However, its moveset made it terrible against a single well-trained opponent, as its moveset left several openings that an opponent could exploit. And for Sephiroth, this makes sense. As all of his engagements, he has been seen immediately jumping back to increase the distance once an opponent got too close. He would use Form 2 Makashi, which would allow him to use precision-based attacks to either bypass an opponent's defense or take advantage of any openings that they would provide. And though this form was specifically designed for sword-to-sword -sword engagements and its lack of kinetic energy attacks within its movesets lacked power, thanks to Sephiroth's physical properties with his strength, he was more than capable of applying power blows within his maneuvers. However, it was with his use of Form 4 Ataru and its heavy reliance on speed-based fury attacks that made Sephiroth extremely dangerous to engage, as his high velocity of speed strikes could immediately force just about any combatant to either fall back to increase the distance or force them to immediately have to go on the defense, and any combatant who lacked mobility or could not hold a strong enough defense for an indefinite period of time had no chance of lasting long against Sephiroth. Ataru's greatest weakness was that its high velocity of attacks made the form extremely tiring, burning out through user's stamina in no time. But again, thanks to his physical properties, this granted Sephiroth nearly infinite supply of stamina, meaning that Sephiroth could keep up this fury-like assault as long as he wished without running the danger of tiring out. However, despite molding his skill set to make him an overwhelming combatant, his approach to combat was not entirely foolproof, and he did suffer from two distinct weaknesses. The first being his own arrogance and his overbloated ego. In his mind, Sephiroth was the greatest warrior the world had ever seen, and therefore believed that no one could realistically challenge him, causing Sephiroth to constantly underestimate his opponents. But Sephiroth's greatest weakness that led to him being defeated on multiple occasions was his terrible reaction time to new maneuvers or new abilities that he was not expecting or had any knowledge of how to respond. It was this notion that led to two of his defeats by Cloud Strife's hands. In their first encounter, after Sephiroth had successfully impaled Cloud, he simply assumed that he would die right then and there, but he was not expecting that a simple infantryman was able to overpower him and throw him aside leading to his first defeat. And in his final engagement against Cloud, after Sephiroth had successfully countered Cloud's ultimate move, the Omi Slash, which led to Cloud being impaled once again, but as Cloud attempted to use the maneuver one more time, Sephiroth was preparing to counter the same maneuver, but again he was caught off guard by a new variation of the technique that he had no idea how to counter, and therefore, by the time he realized what was happening, it was already too late. Comparing Sephiroth to another character from another franchise, Sephiroth as a fighter was the Darth Maul of the franchise. Instead of balancing his combative skills between his use of the blade and his magical abilities, or force abilities in Maul's case, he simply put all of his focus into his swordsmanship while only applying his magic or force abilities in very basic ways. As a swordsman, he is perfectly capable of fighting off multiple opponents at once, he is tactically capable of leading fights to locations of his own choice and wearing his opponents down and exploding openings in an opponent's maneuvers, and he's perfectly capable of meeting powerful offensive head-to-head -head and responding with his own. But if he is ever caught off guard, even if it's for a single moment, Sephiroth's lack of a good reaction time to a new maneuver or technique that he is not expecting will lead to his defeat every single time. Right from the start, there is no question that as individuals, both Zack and Cloud do not stand a chance against Sephiroth, both of either their martial skills or their tactical approaches. Against Sephiroth, Zack and Cloud are at a serious disadvantage. Zack spent years training against Sephiroth holograms, but when he was forced to fight the real Sephiroth, he could barely hold his own, proving that even with all the years of training that he had, that he never took the time to cover up for this weakness, because fighting against the real Sephiroth was a situation that he thought he would never have to deal with. 
and for Cloud, it's even worse. By simply copying Zack, he inherited all of his strengths and weaknesses, but since he was forced to alter Zack's combative approach to best suit the situations that he had to deal with, he could only do so much in such a short amount of time, but he did benefit from having allies that could actually cover up for the weaknesses that he had. This ultimately leads to a situation in which, even though it is two on one, Sephiroth will have complete control and able to dictate how this engagement will play out, and the fight will only last as long as Sephiroth wants to. Because with him being such a tactical genius as a swordsman, Sephiroth is going to spot out immediately the combative weaknesses of both Zack and Cloud long before even they realize it. Even worse for Zack and Cloud is that even though they are best friends, they have absolutely no combative chemistry or experience on how they would fight together. Referring back to Star Wars, a somewhat similar comparison could be made with the connection of the two-on-one lightsaber duel between Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi against Darth Maul. But unlike Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi, who had well over a decade of experience of fighting together and understanding how they would work as a team, which ultimately compelled Maul to have to separate the two and focus on the better of the two combatants in Qui-Gon Jinn, Zack and Clout would not experience nearly as much success. But instead, Sephiroth being so much better than either combatant would separate Zack and Cloud and focus on the weaker of the two, which in this case would be Cloud, and in this situation, once Cloud was dispatched, he would be free to take out Zack, even with Zack in rage with witnessing the death of his best friend. For any one combatant, or any number of combatants, to battle Sephiroth successfully, you need to have a full understanding of oneself combatively inside and out, and if you have any weaknesses, then you need to know exactly how to make up for them. For Cloud, he always had his allies and his friends to make up for his weaknesses, and for Zack, it was simply a matter of not expecting certain situations, and these are weaknesses, and their lack of an effective teamwork system is something that Sephiroth will be able to take advantage of. And it is for all these reasons that Sephiroth gets the unquestionable edge in martial skills and as a battle tactician. When everything is said and done, Cloud during the events of Final Fantasy VII and Zack Fair are simply an insufficient team in order to take down the greatest swordsmen in the entire Final Fantasy franchise. Now in their defense, if we were to take this fight and say swap out Final Fantasy VII Cloud for Advent Children Cloud, then more than likely the two best friends would be able to emerge as the winners. Because with Cloud elevating his combative style to such a high degree, even with not having much time or really any experience fighting as a team, Zack would be more than willing to take a supportive role. And with Sephiroth suffering from a serious case of tunnel vision and his fixation on fighting Cloud, he would give Zack the opening he needs to stab him in the back. And as has been proven in the past, this is more than enough to mortally wound him. Physically, they are outclassed, and it doesn't even matter if they had greater durability, because his skills as a swordsman are so far ahead of theirs that these two are never even going to get a chance to get a good hit on him. Their magical and special abilities edge is completely pointless, because even with his refusal to use magic, Zack and Cloud simply cannot threaten him, and God help them if Sephiroth gets so bored and lazy with these two that he decides to simply blow them away with a magical spell. because he'll feel like they're not worth his time. The only benefit with the Buster Sword that Zack and Cloud can enjoy is that unlike other swords, their weapon will not break, but that won't stop Sephiroth from being able to knock their weapon out of their hands. And as swordsmen, Zack and Cloud lack the skill set and tactical mentality to provide any kind of challenge for Sephiroth. Hell, the most accurate interpretation, in my opinion, of Zack's fight against Sephiroth was shown in Final Fantasy VII The Last Order animated film, and from the moment their blades clashed, the fight was over in exactly 50 seconds. Interestingly enough, I actually found a way to work this fight into the official timeline, so to speak. Let's say this all starts right after Cloud and his allies have defeated Sephiroth in Final Fantasy VII. Still mourning the loss of his best friend and being unable to protect Aerith, Cloud visits the Forbidden Capital, and there as he stands in front of the pool of water that Cloud laid Aerith's body to rest, the water starts to glow, 
in Minervia, the goddess rises out of the water, and sensing his great grief, offers Cloud a chance to travel back in time in order to change the present, and Cloud accepts the offer. Cloud is sent right into Nibelhelm's Maker Reactor right as Zack is entering it to face Sephiroth. Zack pauses at what he's witnessing, and Cloud explains that he is from the future having having just defeated Sephiroth in his own time, and that he has traveled back through time in order to help him defeat Sephiroth and prevent many bad things from happening. Not wanting to waste any time asking too many questions, Zack accepts the help from Cloud and the two make their way into the core of the reactor. There they see Sephiroth standing in front of Genova, and instead of walking right up to Sephiroth as Zack did before, Cloud shouts at Sephiroth. Sephiroth turns around and is intrigued to see two fighters facing him. Zack, he knows, but this blonde spiky haired guy he doesn't know. But noticing from their posture and their stance, they are there to battle him, and he simply asks, will they be enough to entertain him? Zack says that he will take point while Cloud follows his lead, and Cloud agrees. Zack lunges at Sephiroth, but with him not wanting to waste any time with an extended engagement, Sephiroth deflects Zack's first attack and strikes him to the side, knocking Zack into the side of the wall. Before Cloud has time to respond to what has just happened, Sephiroth immediately rushes him, and with Cloud not being familiar with this high-speed fury offense and sword strikes, he is quickly impaled and thrown to the side, seriously injured. Zack tries to come to Cloud's aid, but he is unable to put up any kind of pressure against Sephiroth, who effortlessly blocks all of Zack's attacks. Despite being injured, Cloud attempts to attack Sephiroth from the back while he's engaged with Zack, but with Sephiroth knowing Cloud is behind him, he quickly dodges Cloud's attack, which almost hits Zack in the face, and in that moment of pausing, Sephiroth understands that both of these combatants have no idea how to synchronize their offenses, and with Sephiroth managing to get right behind Cloud, not wanting to waste any more time impaling him for the second time, he immediately decapitates Cloud, causing his body and now dismembered head to fall into the depths of the Mako Reactor. Seeing Cloud's body fall enrages Zack, and he lunges at Sephiroth with an increased intensity, but it's simply not enough, and after a quick exchange of attacks, Sephiroth manages to strike Zack right back out of the core of the reactor, disarming and knocking him out, ending the fight. But this is not the end. As Sephiroth returns to gaze in awe of his mother, he is suddenly stabbed in the back by none other than the younger Cloud from the present. And from that point on, history would play out as it had before, with the only difference being that at the moment of Zack's death, he would be sure to advise Cloud in his final words that should the moment for him to ever go back in time and save him present itself, that he should refuse the offer and continue to live his own life. So I declare Sephiroth, the one-winged angel, the winner. And that will do it for what could end up being my very last Final Fantasy First Series matchup. Now I would like to know, what did you think about it? Do you agree that Zack and Cloud are simply outmatched in just about every single department to take down not just the greatest member of Soldier, but without question the greatest swordsman in the entire franchise? Or do you believe that there is somehow, some way that they could pull off one of the greatest upsets and emerge the winners? Share your thoughts and opinions with me and everyone else in the comments down below, and like always, I would really appreciate if you give this video a like and subscribe to my channel to keep track of me in all my future videos, in an attempt to increase the interest level of this series. And now for the moment of truth has arrived. As stated at the very beginning of this video, this is really my final attempt to save this series, but it is not up to me to decide, it's up to you guys. Now, I will not reveal exactly what matchup will be coming next month, but depending on the performance of how this video does, it will decide what happens next. Now, as it stands now, I have two matches planned, a season finale and a series finale. If this video can hit a minimum of at least 4,000 views by December 15th, then the series will continue on into 2019 with a number of changes and additions being added. But if it fails, then it will end this year. And trust me when I say that 4,000 views is really not that much to ask for for this kind of really popular matchup, because with just 4,000 views, it would make it the fastest viewed matchup of the entire year for this season, and place it just high enough to keep it up with older popular matchups, which, if you can believe it, 
still get thousands of views a month to this day. Depending on what happens, the next matchup will be revealed on December 15th. So now I leave the fate of the 3 tier versus series in your hands. With everything on the line, I would just like to say thank you to everyone who has watched this video and everyone who has watched this series up to this point. Whatever happens to this series, I've really enjoyed every single moment. Thank you guys for watching, and I hope to see you next time.